Thank you so much. So um, welcome again. Uh, again, the, the uh, login uh, information there for CME credit is on your left. Um, upcoming grand rounds, uh, we have a, a, another in our series of uh, COVID related grand rounds. And this one I think will be particularly relevant uh, as both parents and pediatricians. Um, we have two psychiatrists uh, and, and then a, a, one of our a wonderful community pediatricians talking about mental health needs uh, during the pandemic. And then uh, on June 12th, we have one of my favorite grand rounds of the year, which is um, always the, the chief resident's uh, summary of, of their uh, work uh, from, from uh, the, their chief year. And, and, and this particular year, uh, it will be really exciting to hear about bringing evidence to the bedside uh, and evidence-based medicine curriculum. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Bonnie. Um, so please get your nominations in for the staff and faculty awards. Uh, they are all listed here on the right, and um, you can go to the website at the bottom. Please try to nominate uh, by June 12th, um, and this is a great way to get recognition for your colleagues. And then next slide. And this is the, the list of um, grand rounds that we have had relating to the pandemic. Um, and they are all available on the, both the pediatrics department website and the pediatric grand rounds website. Uh, all are free and accessible to everybody. Um, and I, I think uh, as a way to uh, frame uh, the introduction for this morning, uh, you will notice that uh, Dr. Maldonado's uh, picture is on two of these. And, and what's funny is that there was a, a third grand rounds that she gave during this relatively short time period that uh, also, uh, did uh, It was a, a red book and vaccine update, but also did spend a little bit of time talking about some important uh, coronavirus updates. So uh, we are very, very appreciative for Dr. Maldonado's uh, involvement uh, throughout this pandemic. Um, it's been pretty hard to, to, to read a newspaper article or turn on uh, the local or national news and, and not see her name. Um, she's really been front and center uh, doing groundbreaking work and keeping us all in the loop um, about what's going on. And, and um, so she's been introduced several times uh, by Dr. Leonard. Um, I think we all know her. She's a professor of pediatrics. She's a division chief of pediatric infectious disease and a senior associate dean here, also chair of the um, uh, Committee on Infectious Disease for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, so uh, she's gonna talk about questions that I think are really at the forefront of all of our minds today, uh, namely, um, how in the heck are we going to move forward? So uh, Dr. Maldonado, I wanna uh, really express the appreciation on behalf of everyone in the community and the department uh, for leading us uh, throughout this, these trying times. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alan, uh, for that introduction. And um, I uh, don't, profess to have any answers. So just to start off, we're not gonna give you the magical formula, but um, I am gonna depend on a number of my, uh, I use my tools and my tools are epidemiology, infectious diseases, uh, common sense and uh, evidence-based one as much as we can uh, to try to understand what we might be able to do and I changed the title. I realized that work was going to be too much to get to, so I'm really going to focus on school. But a lot of the issues will involve teachers and other staff, so there will be some element of general work principles as well. So I just want to mention I am a member of a data safety monitoring board for Pfizer for a Pfizer vaccine trial. And the objectives today are to understand SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 and how the virus is transmitted because that will help us understand what we need to do to prevent infection uh, during school time, uh, to develop tools to mitigate risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection, primarily in work, uh, in school settings. And then uh, a general guideline around implementing ways to measure risk of SARS-CoV-2 transmission in school and how to mitigate that. So first of all, it's important for us to know, and there will be some a repetition here, but I think it's important for everybody to be at the same uh, place around what we know about SARS-CoV-2 spread in populations. So we know this is a, an RNA virus and it is primarily spread via the respiratory route. However, there is some evidence, obviously, of fomite transmission. 
And there is a role potentially of aerosol transmission, but that role is unclear. However, there appears to be in some situations some uh, role for aerosol transmission, although that's quite limited uh, as far as we understand from the epidemiologic perspective. Uh, there also is evidence of what we call super spreaders or super spreading events, and I'll talk a little bit about that, although it's a fairly complex and not well understood concept. I find that this is a general term for we don't really understand, but we think there's risk for large outbreaks. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So the main modes of transmission, as you heard, are really droplet transmission. In my view, that's probably accounting for the vast majority of transmission that we've seen. And the epidemiologic, epidemiologic profile supports that. If we had other methods of transmission that were more um, uh, accounting, accounted for more uh, transmission, I think we would be seeing a different, a different type of pandemic, a different epidemic here. So, and this is really means uh, droplets that are generated from coughing, sneezing, or even talking. These can be dispersed for six feet or even more. Uh, but generally, we think that uh, six feet is about a, a good distance to stay away for in most situations where you can really avoid a lot of these droplets. This is, as I said, the most common mode of transmission, at least from the epidemiologic perspective. We do know that there is evidence of aerosol transmission and that people have found small micro droplets in the air for up to three hours. I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and that the virus may survive on surfaces like plastic and stainless steel for two to three days. But uh, we have to emphasize that the virus also is quite, uh, it's a lipid enve enveloped virus. And so it is highly, um, uh, it's a, it highly susceptible to inactivation uh, by disinfectants. And then finally, we, uh, we know that uh, there is fecal oral spread there um, potentially. Uh, the virus has been found in stool, but we don't know we don't know the extent of transmission from uh, fecal oral spread. But it has been found in bathrooms of infected individuals and in stool. And we do think that based on a number of models and uh, outbreaks, that um, most individuals who spread disease are symptomatic. Although obviously you can become infected from an asymptomatic individual. This study uh, from from March uh, in JAMA demonstrates that if you see a number of individuals here, uh, up to 307 people who had a number of different uh, methods of sampling for virus, found that uh, you could see that 93% um, of BAL specimens were positive, 46% of brush biopsy specimens were positive, sputum, nasal swabs, pharyngeal swabs were positive, as well as some fe fecal samples a one uh, out of uh, three out of 100, 307 uh, blood samples and no urine samples. And the cycle threshold really just means the number of cycles of PCR uh, replication it takes to detect virus. And the higher the number, the lower the viral load. So you can see that it looks like the highest viral load or the lowest CT was actually from nasal swabs. And some of our studies are so showing that as well, that uh, from the front of the nose, there's probably quite quite high high uh, volume of virus, and tends to be more likely to be found in highly symptomatic individuals rather than less symptomatic individuals over time or pre-symptomatic individuals. This is a slide that generated a, quite a bit of controversy back in the old days, meaning uh, probably early March, uh, where you see here that SARS and SARS-CoV-2, so the original SARS virus here in blue and the new, back then it was not called SARS-CoV-2 in red. And you could see that in an experimental study, there was uh, evidence of uh, SARS and SARS-CoV-2 for up to three hours. The study didn't go beyond three hours, so hard to know if it lasted longer than that. But this was not in human, uh, human uh, studies. This was in an in vitro setting. And you can see that in copper and cardboard, uh, the virus did not last very long, but steel and plastic, it seemed to last for anywhere from about 24 to maybe 48 hours. So we do know that the virus can sit on surfaces for some time. This study was quite important. And a couple of weeks ago in my Red Book Committee, we had the uh, authors of this paper come and talk to us virtually, um, and they followed up on it. And this study looked at uh, the potential of, of SARS-CoV-2 
in viral shedding at the University of Nebraska where they have a large biocontainment facility. And they sampled uh, the patient rooms of a number of COVID patients there and they uh, did PCR and then they also did culture to look for evidence of live virus. And here you can see a slide uh, that shows you all of the different areas that they sampled, including the bedside table, bed rails, air handling grates, which is an area where air is sucked into. So you would expect a high concentration there. And indeed you find uh, high numbers of gene copies there. This is gene copies uh, based on PCR and in other places in the room at very, very low levels, including the hallway outside the room, the toilet, et cetera. However, I will say that when they tried to grow the virus, they were not able to grow virus from any of these samples. And I asked them about this a couple of weeks ago because this paper is about two months old now or plus. And they, uh, the author said they still have not been able to grow samples. So we don't know if these numbers just represent gene fragments that are still found in samples uh, in the environment, uh, but it's because so far they have not been able to cultivate live virus from any of these sites. So we still think that aerosol could be possible in certain situations, especially high density situations, but we, it's not been proven with live viral uh, results. This is a slide that's very complicated, but I couldn't find an easier one. So I'm just gonna explain it to you and hope you trust me on the, on the graphs there. Took me a while to read it. This is a paper from 2005 and it's a nature paper talking about what super spreading means. And it's really a, a modeling term. Uh, the idea is that basically um, in general, when people look at contact tracing and other uh, general outbreak situations, that there some, seems to be in many situations a 20-80 rule. That is, it appears that about 20% of infections and of outbreaks or infection transmissions occur, I'm sorry, about 20% of people or individuals may be responsible for up to 80% of transmissions. Um, that can mean a lot of things. That, can, that means that R0 is important, but it's not the only thing that's important. Uh, it may be that R0 is different in different situations. And we know that that's true. It's actually R0 is, is a theoretical concept, but RT, which is the R0 in the real uh, world situation, the RT is variable over time. And what this slide shows you is that there is a variability in the number of cases that can occur uh, in different scenarios. And that for different diseases, such as here, this is SARS. Remember, this was 2005, when we were still right after the SARS uh, pandemic, uh, epidemic. And then these are other agents like plague. There is a variety of transmissions occurring uh, over uh, populations. And again, here you can see the same thing. And all of this is to say, is that this is a dispersion issue. So much like you would have somebody with large amounts of virus in their nose or mouth and they are speaking loudly or forcefully or yelling um, and you are close to those first people or in their household, that's called the force of transmission. You are more likely to see uh, transmission within that cluster than you might if you're say, for example, outside um, and you're not speaking as loudly or you don't have a high viral load. All of that to say that these predictions are R naughts and R T's are uh, averages or medians, but the disease extinctions are much more dispersed and uh, may include the outliers where there may be a large explosive outbreak versus a slow indolent outbreak. Um, so we do think that uh, super spreaders do exist, but they're not one person or one type of person. That's rather a combination of events. So what do we know about COVID? So hopefully that helps you understand how the virus gets around. What happens in children? Now, I'll give you the punchline here right off the bat. We don't really know, but I'll give you some whatever evidence that we do know so far. And we're actually, last night I was uh, speaking to a number of people. We're hopefully gonna be planning a pretty comprehensive school-based study in the fall to try to understand how this actually, what happens with children. So really excited that that will go forward. We're hopeful that we will be able to start in August and, and understand more. But what do we understand? Well, I took some slides from um, data from the MMWR and the link is there. Uh, but the American Academy of Pediatrics put together some slide sets and I'll give you the resources at the end. And you can see that among uh, all of the people who were reported uh, with HIV, uh, sorry, we're forgetting, that's not HIV, this is COVID disease. 
uh, in the United States in the middle of March, only about 2% of those people were children. Uh, but you can see here that um, they make a very small share of the number of tests also reported. So are we just testing less children? Um, and this is, um, this is by age here. You can see the percent positive over time in children is here in the dark bars, zero to 17. So we may not be testing children very often, but we're also not seeing a lot of sick children either in the hospital. Now, if you look again at the same MMWR report, you can see over time, these are the number of in, uh, individuals under 18 years of age from the end of February through the beginning of April, and you see the number is cumulative, so of course it's gonna go up, but again, only representing about 2% of people that are reported. Uh, notice, noting, of course, that there's a lot of underreporting and that probably many of these children were reported because they had symptoms. So we still need to understand what is the rate of disease of asymptomatic disease in children. Well, the, there are some studies that have looked at this, not very many. And remember, we stopped, we closed down schools all around the world before we could really understand what happens around disease transmission in schools and in congregate settings other than households. And households, you could argue, are not exactly representative of large populations. They might be spread within one household or another, but you can't really tell what's gonna happen in the general population. So this study in Iceland was helpful because it was done um, uh, earlier in the year and it was really made up of two samples of patients. One were, was a group of high risk people with high risk uh, symptoms and the other was a community-based general population study. And when you look at the high risk symptom patients, uh, about 7% of, of the uh, children zero to nine years of age with symptoms were positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2, but in the community settings, children were not represented, very represented at all. In fact, 10 to 19 year olds were less than 1%. So we do think this shows you that there is risk of transmission among children, but as the overall population in the community, it's quite low, at least in Iceland. And we think that, may, that there's nothing different in those populations. And then finally, if you want to see what the symptoms look like in those children that we reported earlier, the 2%, you see that most children uh, who will have symptoms will have fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Uh, but there are others that are less commonly reported in adults, such as nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, um, um, diarrheal disease as well. And then I wanted to just briefly mention this new multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And here's the case definition. I won't go through the whole thing. This is, uh, the, the link is there at the bottom. But it seems to be, as, a, as you hear, as, you would, as the title implies, a multi-organ inflammatory response. Uh, it does not appear to be a response to the uh, primary infection, but rather a week or two afterwards reflecting some kind of an immune response or other inflammatory trigger in children who've been infected with the virus. So if you look at uh, this disease, and this is from Cohen Children's Medical Center in uh, New York, uh, they compared children with this syndrome and they had a different name for it, pediatric MIS, there's way too many different names for it associated with acute COVID-19 and differences from Kawasaki disease, you see that these children tended to be older with a median age of eight compared to children with uh, 2.5 years of age with Kawasaki's disease. There was a higher proportion with shock, who presented with shock, with much higher inflammatory markers, that is with CRPs of 10 or above, with high ferritins and D-dimers, and a higher proportion with GI symptoms, abdominal pain, and tenderness. It is important to note that the mortality rate is actually quite low with this disease as far as we understand so far, with most of the kids in shock being able to be resuscitated and, uh, and, and recovered in, in a quick, quite a short period of time. And here's an epidemic curve from the cases that are reported out of Northwell, which had uh, uh, about 65 cases, and you can see that um, these were the children who had primary COVID infection, that is symptoms uh, that we traditionally associate with COVID and a positive PCR, and then you had these 38 children here who developed that uh, multi-inflammatory syndrome 
Most of these kids actually were not ever PCR positive, but then developed antibody. And this is around the time when their antibody developed and their symptoms of MISC developed. And we don't really understand that relationship quite well at this point. So now let's move on. So we understand now about transmission and we understand also uh, what happens with children so far. We don't have a lot to go on, so we don't know if children are less likely to be infected or whether they are more likely just to be asymptomatically infected. Um, there, and I didn't put the slide in, I didn't think I'd have time to talk about it, but there's one study that, uh, of, of nasal epithelial biopsies from an ENT program, and they were able to look for the receptor, a, the ACE2, the angiotensin converting, converting enzyme 2 receptor, uh, in nasal epithelial biopsies from a wide range of ages. And they demonstrated that the, uh, there was a, a proportional number of receptor density in, by age. So that is younger children, the younger you are, the less ACE2 uh, receptors there were in the nasal epithelial biopsy. So there is a suggestion at least that there may be a lower physiologic risk because there may be less receptors for the virus in young children, but we don't know that that's an, a, a, causa, a causal relationship. It's, a, it's an association at this point, and we need further studies in that regard. So what about risk mitigation? Well, I'm going to go over a number of areas, uh, and I'll use AAP and CDC guidance, and I'm also going to give credit to Lee Sanders, who also provided a, a similar discussion to the county health department last week about the, this week or last week about this issue. Um, and um, we're we are going to really be focusing on the areas that we know so far have worked. That is physical distancing, face masks, hand washing, frequent cleaning of surfaces, and then the question mark around physical testing and uh, PCR testing and physical barriers, I won't address directly because we don't really know when and how to do that. And I'll show you a model uh, of a, a, a model that was put together uh, by me and one of my co our colleagues here at Stanford uh, around what might happen um, in a scenario of return to school in a university setting. So um, other areas that we'd like to talk about, and I'll briefly go over these as well, are how do you mitigate uh, uh, and measure, measure effectiveness of mitigation? Uh, one thing we can do is track symptoms. So obviously symptom trackers are critical in populations when you bring them back because you wanna keep out the most symptomatic individuals, whether or not they're positive. You wanna keep people with, with respiratory disease out anyway because you don't wanna spread other infections. And if you can do this consistently for everybody in your population, it will be easier to avoid um, an exposure and then having to chase an outbreak rather than prevent one. And as we all know in the hospital setting, uh, prevention of outbreaks is really much more effective and it's obviously better for patient care. It would be better for kids in school as well. Contact tracing is still very important. So once you do have an infection, you want to know who that person has been exposed to and who's been exposed to that person and make sure you do the proper mitigation for that person, either keeping them out of school, keeping them, uh, watching their symptoms as well. It depends on local regulations, um, but making sure that you track that. Tra uh, again, tracking infections and contact tracing. Also, city and county trends are important and especially aligning with county and state regulations. So. We can all go above and beyond county and state regulations, but you need to at least do what your county and state requires. And that can be a little complicated because as you know, we live in an area with nine major counties around us of over 7 million populations. So we uh, do cross borders frequently and one county may have different standards compared to another. They generally align, but there may be some subtle differences. So schools need to really balance all of those things. Now, let me talk a bit about the American Academy guidelines, and um, I, I put the link down below. It's really easy to find. You can just Google AAP, uh, corona, you can just Google COVID-19 and AAP, and you'll find the link. Um, they support a decision-making uh, that's collaborative among school districts and local and state public health departments. Um, I actually have learned, uh, I didn't know this before, many of you may have, but really the school districts are autonomous in that sense. So there are many school districts within a county or within the state. And so 
it may be that each school district will have their own policy that again meets at least the basic a local a county and state guideline, but may have different uh, individual uh, uh, guidelines above and beyond that. And the way to make these decisions or this shared decision making is dependent on several factors. Of course, the first and most important thing is to understand the local and national epidemiology of the virus. In general, it's a good idea to uh, not really consider school opening if you are in the middle of a massive outbreak, and that's what happened, uh, we thought, back in March when we said we, be we better send people home because we don't, we're in the middle of a new outbreak. We don't know what can happen. I think in the fall, if we keep at the pace that we are now, which is really not zero, but also not uh, massive numbers of cases, this could be an optimal time to consider opening schools Although we do know that there is circulation of virus, so there will be need to be a number of uh, checks and balances in place. And some of those include things like testing, community surveillance, and contact tracing. It sounds simple and in some ways boring and routine, but this is critical. It's like washing your hands. Nobody thinks it's that important, but it's super important. Uh, testing uh, and, on, and, and on what scale you test is unclear. So do we test once and stop? Do we test every week, every month? How do we do this? Do you test the household? The answer is we don't know. Um, we will, what we did here, for example, in the hospital is we tested 12,000 of our 15,000 healthcare workers at both hospitals, and we found a very low rate of infections, and, and none of those were demonstrated to be hospital transmissions. So at that point, we stopped testing, and we said if we start to see a signal, we will start testing again. And I think that is a good approach that is, if people start considering testing, if they have the capacity to test uh, some children up front, that would be useful in understanding whether kids are infected, but some t places may not choose to do that. In any event, con uh, tracking symptoms at least will be very critical. That is, every day, every child and their family should be tracking at the school, uh, whether or not they have a fever or any of the symptoms I mentioned before. Uh, around COVID, and if they do, they should stay home. And then that person should be encouraged to get a test done. But whether or not the whole school decides to be tested is, is uh, not clear, and it's, there's no specific guideline for that. The other area to, uh, these are obviously practical measures to limit spread, that is using appropriate disinfecting sanitation, sanitizing procedures. How often to the, do that is unclear. Some places will say twice a day, some every few hours. It really depends on the setting, the age of the kids, the density, et cetera. Uh, again, monitoring illness uh, for, among staff and students. M using masks in people who can use them is going to be critical. And uh, again, the age cutoff is unclear. Uh, many people think that 10 or above would be okay. Some people would recommend younger than that, although in an infection control world, we really don't think that masks will be helpful in kids six years of age and under because they won't be able to maintain a mask uh, for any extended period of time. Um, and so, and, and even if they did, they would probably be touching their face anyway. So really masking of adults will be important in some older age groups, certainly middle school and above. Limiting interactions of students. Um, I was talking to one school that will be putting the children in pods, that is virtual pods. So there will be circles on the ground, like you saw, I think uh, one of the parks in San Francisco d drew circles that were uh, a certain width and a certain distance from each other so that children could sit within that circle spaced apart. And there would at least be physical ways for them to tell where they should be sitting. And then needing the, having access to supplies is very important. In addition, we need to know more about the role of school children in transmission. And obviously the only way to do that is to wait till we go back to school and start to do those studies. So unfortunately, we'll be learning in real time. So uh, we also have to be aware that we may have to close schools. We don't know that that will happen. I, I hope that that doesn't happen if we follow these rules and we test and keep kids out who are sick, um, then that might not have to happen. Uh, but there may be that possibility, and the trigger for that is unclear as well. Is it one case? In some situations, for example, in Israel, in parts of Europe, in Asia, um, one infection in a school led to closures of the whole school. 
In other places, it may not be uh, that low a bar. There may need to be two or three infections, maybe in different in one age group or one cluster. Um, one idea that was floated was perhaps you put children in pods, that is groups of maybe five to 10, and that if one child, if there was one person in that group was infected, perhaps that whole group would come out of school and the other groups would not. So there's a lot of ways to consider this, but we don't really know which one would work best or at all. So options for phased reopening uh, will be really important. So beginning with reduced hours or certain classes or grades, so you can monitor the impact, uh, limiting the number of children in each uh, classroom setting is going to be important as well. Um, processes for communication, obviously with the local and state public health departments will be critical. Um, I think uh, every school and, the, and knowing that the counties and the state health departments are going to be overwhelmed probably in the fall, it would be great for schools to have standard operating protocols written in place with lots of communication within the staff and a good contact person at the county level. And then ongoing training and professional development is absolutely necessary for every single staff member at a school, for all of the parents, and to the extent that we can do this training of children in very simple measures that they can use to learn how to co uh, pr practice proper respiratory etiquette, um, distance from one another, not touch one another, et cetera. So let me talk now about CDC guidance. I'm not going to spend, uh, go through all of these points, but you do see at the bottom there a link to the CDC coronavirus website. Um, and so this is guidance for schools. And what it says here is, should you consider opening? Uh, will it be consistent with applicable state and local orders? Is the school ready to protect children and employees at higher risk for severe illness? Are you able to screen? for symptoms, and if you say no to any of those, then you cannot open or you should not consider opening. But if you can, then you need to look to the next uh, column, which says our recommended health and safety actions in place. That is, are you promoting healthy hygiene practices such as hand washing and employee, all employees, so adults wearing cloth face coverings, intensifying cleaning, disinfection, and especially ventilation. We think that ventilation might be helpful in dispersing the virus away from uh, individuals. Encouraging social distancing through increased spacing, small groups, and limited mixing between groups is feasible. So again, this idea of a pod approach could be helpful in some schools. And then training. So if you can meet all of those, um, then you could meet, you could move to the next step. If you have, um, if you say no, then, uh, then at that point, you need to go back and visit all of these guidelines and make sure you can say yes to all of these. And then finally, you need to put ongoing monitoring in place, including developing and implementing procedures to check for signs and symptoms every single day. If it's possible, a, an online tracker, a web tracker, a, um, an email system, a, a, an app system, whatever it is that people can use. And you know, we are in the Silicon Valley, so at least here, there should be ways to develop good web-based or app-based trackers, but in smaller schools, maybe there are other ways to do that. In any event, uh, this needs to be followed for every single person entering the school, including the staff and the teachers and uh, parents who are coming up to drop the children off encouraging anyone who is sick or has symptoms uh, to stay home regardless of whether they know that they are infected or not because it's always a good practice. You shouldn't be coming to school sick. And remember, children with COVID were known to have atypical symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So even GI symptoms would be considered a reason to stay home. There needs to be a plan for uh, what happens if students or employees get sick and not only a plan for alternate care sources for those people, but also what happens to the people left behind in school? Is there an exposure plan that is put in place that can be implemented for the kids who are still in school? Uh, regularly, again, communicating with your local health authorities and families um, to make sure everybody knows that there may have been an exposure, but also keeping in mind that uh, uh, infection is reportable to counties, but it is also HIPAA uh, um, protected. So people should not be 
made aware. And we were talking last night about ways to do that. So for example, if one, if, if one child does not show up for school one day, um, there should be methods put in place to not uh, have any negative repercussions for that child or that family. Um, and perhaps a pod approach would mean if a pod is, if one, one person in a pod is infected, perhaps that pod could agree that they would all stay home and then maybe the kids in the pod who weren't infected get tested at a certain day, certain number of days afterwards and then be able to come back. Uh, so that again, there wouldn't be one child singled out. Um, and that would be good infection control practice as well. Uh, would need to also monitor employee absences and student absences and have flexible leave policies and practices. One of the issues that we face in the hospital around this area is that uh, we need to con be concerned about union issues. So for example, we are not legally, uh, through union rules, we're not allowed to ask employees why they're staying home. They can take sick leave or PTO, but we're not allowed to ask why they're taking sick leave. So if somebody has an illness, we cannot ask them what that illness is. If they volunteer, if that is helpful, um, and their own provider or occupational health would have to be obligated to report that to the county, but, but the uh, employer uh, does not need to know or is not allowed to know that unless they volunteer it. Monitoring absences, uh, we talked about, and then finally, uh, consulting local health authorities. So we have to make sure these are all in place and then one can then consider opening the school and monitoring. Now, what about guidance uh, in a little more uh, detail here? So uh, these are kind of the kinds of things that one could recommend. So for example, around personal safety, we obviously have our annual routine vaccines and we know how hard it has been in the last few years to really uh, enforce that uh, among some groups. And we've already heard, for example, people that have already said that if there were a COVID vaccine, they would not take it. Um, and uh, so we're a little concerned about that. We're also worried about studies that have shown uh, decreased, significantly decreased rates of immunization of young children in the last few months because of restrictions around going out fear of going out and uh, uh, pediatric practices that may not be able to take all children. So there's a lot of reasons for this and we really need to address the issue of having children receive all their routine vaccinations. Again, staying home from si when sick, hand washing, face covering when age appropriate. We talked about small classes and actually for daycares, there are county-based regulations. I was working with one daycare in the local area here that was very strictly adhering to the county regulations around what the class size had to look like and it's much smaller. So there may need to be more teachers and teacher's aides. Um, there also may need to be some issues around uh, the ability to teach all classes in, uh, in the classroom setting. So there may need to be pods, for example, bubble uh, st staggered start times. There may actually need to be some virtual teaching still that will still go on if you have staggered times. Uh, six foot spacing will still be important for the classroom, for eating areas and hallways. I know that in some areas are the school lunches will be uh, either provided packaged, prepackaged, um, without a lot of touching amongst the packaging, um, or children will be required to bring their own lunch if they're able to do that. Um, and that those should be wiped down before they're brought into the classroom. Physical barriers have been discussed as well, such as plexiglass or others. Um, uh, and then around maintenance, adequate disinfection and supplies, adequate ventilation, and the disinfection really needs to uh, take place more, hopefully more than once a day. So either at least once in the morning or at least in the evening when uh, the school shuts down and preferably more than once a day if possible. For facilities, I won't go through this whole list, but this is really the kind of checklist that the school or the facility would want to look at um, to go through every day uh, and make sure that um, people are ready uh, to, uh, to be able to uh, handle this. That is in terms of the school staffing. We know that schools are already constrained with numbers of teachers um, and staff members who can help. So this would need to be an additional job for people uh, to take on. 
And while we're talking about this school reopening, um, I can also mention that some schools, for example, are thinking about starting a little bit early this fall and ending at the Thanksgiving break so that you can have a longer period of time between Thanksgiving and January so that children can have some time at home, people can all take a break. Um, and because that's flu season and RSV season and every other respiratory virus season, um, in addition to potential for surge in COVID, and that way uh, it would be a lot easier to control potential surges and the risk of reintroduction into a school setting. So in terms of monitoring, again, I cannot emphasize this enough, but symptom checking, and you know that we all have to go through that when we go into the hospital. We luckily have our little QR scanner. We can just at, do our attestation there, get our little sticker on our badge and our mask. Um, and then temperature measurements, whether those are uh, temp measured at home um, or at the uh, front door, sometimes it's easier and faster for kids to get in if the parents can take the temperatures in the morning at home and report them when they get to school. Testing and contact tracing, absenteeism measurements, and having on-site school health services would be helpful, but as we know, we're already woefully underfunded for school nurses, especially in public school settings. So let's think about other things as well. Child and staff wellness. This is a very stressful time. Children feel this as well. Uh, encouraging wellness breaks where no news, no social media goes around. Healthy eating, exercise, and sleep. I think parents would really need that too in addition to their children. Uh, uh, many parents of young children are struggling to juggle lots of, uh, lots of other responsibilities. There's an article in the New York Times this morning about women in the workforce and the impact of COVID um, on their ability to continue in the workforce, at least for the short term because of these issues. Now, this should be a family matter for husband, uh, women and men, but uh, it, we all know that most studies demonstrate that uh, women do tend to take on a, a, a heftier share of a lot of the um, activities in the home. Uh, encouraging awareness of mental health, intimate partner violence and social stressors, and violence against children. This is a very stressful time economically as well and a, a time when children may experience a social, a psychological or physical abuse as well. And, and we need to be aware of that. And trauma-informed care is critical and training for that in schools is going to be important as well. Uh, so bringing a lot more issues to the school uh, staff and the teachers um, is going to be a substantial uh, impact on our teachers and I think we all need to be supportive of them as they try to venture into this giant world uh, that they will be facing watching our children and teaching them as well. And then around nutrition, remember that a lot of children are gonna be impacted economically. They may not be able to bring lunches. So school meals will be critical. Even now that schools are closed, some schools were still providing meals uh, even when there were not classes because some of the children that they were serving did not have access to meals. Now the meals should be provided in non-congregate settings, that is with spacing, so that, uh, and in packet, if, if these are provided by the school, packaged meals uh, that, uh, that don't require a lot of handling amongst people so the kids can pick up one or be handed one, uh, one uh, package of food and they can handle it themselves. And if they need, the younger ones need support, that that particular person is careful to practice good hand hygiene in between children. Then uh, another issue is around trauma-informed care. And again, I have to thank Lee Sanders for this help, uh, these slides. Establishing universal service for mental health support. And this involves training teachers and staff and how to provide that. So this is psychological first aid referring students requiring more help with suicidality, anxiety, and panic attacks, grief reactions for those who've lost loved ones. I was talking to colleagues in New York who are facing the loss of their own colleagues and their family members while they are caring for huge burdens of populations in the hospital. And as you know, um, there have been a number of people who have suffered severe um, PTSD and uh, suicidality um, 
Uh, and these are people who have not had mental health problems in the past. So we do know that those with existing conditions could also be at increased risk. So guidance for special populations. This is also in the uh, AAP guidance, but I'm giving you this one from Kids in Common here. You can see that in Santa Clara Valley, uh, we have a number of children uh, with a, a disability who might need special assistance of some kind. We are also dealing with homeless children, socially disadvantaged children, um, socioeconomically disadvantaged children, clearly exist within our populations um, all over the country and even in this wealthy area. In fact, the disparities can be even more stark for these children uh, who may be in classrooms where other children do not have such disadvantaged status. English uh, ability may be an issue for understanding and communicating to children how to uh, behave in this pandemic uh, era. And then foster youth as well may have other issues around access to care, mental health issues, and, and, and support. So we need to remember that there are these risk groups um, that, uh, that exist. We need to have checklists available. And I know that even when my, when my children were young, we had checklists in the nursing office or the principal's office with the, actually the, the, the front desk uh, person was the surrogate nurse, but at least we had checklists with supplies and there were strict rules around who could give those and having uh, a, a permission to give uh, medications. We need to be aware of emergency preparedness and primary care contact information. Um, athletes are a whole separate area. I've been working with the PAC-12 um, and with the Stanford University uh, Athletics Group on their guidelines, which are still evolving. So we'll have to see what's going to happen there. It will be basically the same guidelines, but much more uh, intensive because these are people who will have much more close contact, et cetera. I won't talk about those in detail here today. And then staff with chronic illness are also important to keep in mind. The issues around pregnant staff, uh, we are still working out. At this time, the CDC does not recognize that pregnant individuals are considered at high risk, but we need to monitor that situation and make sure that we do know that uh, pregnant women, even though COVID may not specifically uh, select out for these people, that pregnant women um, are at higher risk for complications from respiratory illnesses or other illnesses in general. So we do need to make accommodations and the potential for remote work sites, not only for our staff, but again, for some children who may need those um, intermittently or throughout the school year and trying to keep them engaged socially. And then around communication, this is probably, I think other than keep putting the, uh, the, the uh, guidelines in place for monitoring health, uh, communicating these guidelines is so important because if we don't have the communication, at least my own experience in the hospital setting with infection control, is that if we don't have communication and we have a lot of policies and nobody knows about them, they're just not gonna work, obviously. You need to let staff, students, and families know what's going on. Schools should consider having an ombudsperson or a spokesperson who can speak for all sides in an uh, impartial way to help understand these. I, I recognize how hard it is to get consensus uh, but it needs to be done so that everybody is on board. We know that there are a wide array of views about, well, I don't believe in masks versus I only want to be around people who have masks all the time. And there is that bell-shaped curve and we're gonna have to learn how to deal with that. And there may have to be repercussions if people are not going to oblige with or, or uh, uh, comply with whatever plan the schools have set up. Signage needs to be uh, taken into consideration around literacy issues. We here in the Bay Area have uh, dozens of languages. Um, and, and so if you can at least have the top few languages in place, uh, that would be helpful. If there are families that have uh, languages that are not in the top uh, five or six that we can uh, have access to, uh, getting assistance for those families to make sure that we are communicating with them adequately is important. Simple videos that can be given to families so they can view them online or even 
uh, some time at school if they don't have web access is important. And that's the other issue. Uh, many families may not have internet access at home. And I was really heartbroken and yet um, hopeful at the same time to see that some of the school districts in the Bay Area and other places were bringing buses into parking lots and providing Wi-Fi access in the buses so that people could come into the parking lots, park near the bus, and actually have their children do their homework because those families did not have access to the internet. This is something that we need to be very aware of. We are going to face a generation of children, at least for another year or so, where they may fall behind because they don't have access to the same tools that some of the ch other children will. And this is another example of a health disparity or an economic disparity that can really set children back. And once you're set back, it is harder to catch up over time. Although it can be done, we prefer not to have that happen. Educating around disease prevention, integrating that into the existing curriculum, age, gender, ethnicity, disability responsive activities are always important no matter what, but more important today when we're dealing with a pandemic where there can be social economic and health um, ramifications. And so then uh, guidance for school reopening. Here's an example from the CDC website. You can pull down any of these and put them up at schools. They're very easy to look at. Sometimes you, can, you don't even need the words. You can just use universal symbols. So I'm gonna finish up and I know I'm close to time, but I wanna present a few slides from my colleague, Kristen Stoudemire, who's a professor of uh, associate professor of surgery as trauma surgeon and has been working with me uh, with the university on predicting modeling of undergraduate housing and isolation capacity. I won't go through a lot of the details, but I want to make a point here that you're, we're going to have to look at very similarly to what we're doing with schools on arrival screening uh, and what kind of testing that will involve. So it's very similar and whether we do it differently in grad, uh, undergraduates and graduate students compared to preschool and K through eight or high school doesn't matter, you still need to do that. Mitigation strategies, meaning reduced density on campus, environmental services, surveillance and symptom testing are critical, and then outbreak plans are very important. In a school setting, what will you do if you have an infection or more than one? Will you shut the school down? Will you shut down a pod of children? What exactly is your trigger for that? And you need to work that out ahead of time. It does not work when you are thinking about it in real time and trying to decide in the moment. Now, what we did is we used a basic uh, 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 susceptible SIR model, which is susceptible immune and, and recovered model to look at uh, prediction, predicting on-campus disease spread, deriving the number of students who might be needed to quarantine, and then matching those numbers to the physical space. Now here on campus, it's a different matter because we can't send kids home. They have to stay on campus somewhere, at least for the short term. And we looked at, um, I won't go through all of these right now, but the, the assumptions we made was that most of the kids that we find on campus who are infected will probably be symptomatic and that most students who are symptomatic will actually come in for testing. Uh, we will pick up about 30% of cases in a conservative model because we know that a number of people will not know they're sick or they will be asymptomatic or they won't, it just won't come in. Um, and if we look at the current California R0 or RT, it's 0.9. So we are hovering just below the rate of constant uh, uh, replication, uh, uh, ongoing change of transmissions. A moderate rate is for an RT of 4.6, which is actually reasonably high because we think the overall RT might be somewhere around 2 to 2.8. And then a high rate is what happened in New York City of six. And if you look at this, this is what happens overall in an SIR model. That is the number of susceptible people drops over time. The number of infected people goes up over time and then eventually people recover. The problem with our um, disease here is that we're not gonna get anywhere near um, everybody getting to this point. We're only gonna be talking about one to two to 5% at most of people who will get infected. So it's gonna take many months to a couple years and a vaccine and antiviral treatment to get our populations to be, uh, uh, all uh, to get them to be immune. And then what you do is you look at infections, 
incubation periods, symptomatic people who are tested, those identified by screening, and then those who we find. So this is number infected to the number we identify is gonna be a big drop. We'll not identify everybody. But the bottom line here is that no matter what you do, and we, I won't tell you what the scenarios are. You saw, probably saw them from the a president of the university and the provost. There are gonna be a number of scenarios where we'll probably bring two class years per quarter back to school. So for example, freshmen and seniors or freshmen and juniors, and then the next quarter, two other class years. Uh, it doesn't matter how you set it up. The, the bottom line here is regardless of the scenario of how you bring people on board, what drives the number of infections, and they're the similar across all these scenarios, and believe me, these scenarios are very different, is how, what your RT is. And that is how infectious people are going to be within each other. And what that means is masking, social distancing, hand hygiene, and, and really guide, guiding people to keep that going. So if we don't do those simple things of keeping people from infecting one another, by following masking, et cetera, that doesn't matter what you do in, this, in, the, in, the, um, in the environment. Now, one of the things that you can do most often, which is easy in a university setting as well as in a school setting, is making sure that you distance people as much as possible. So in a dorm setting, here at Stanford, we are gonna go to single room dorms for anybody who comes back, which is why we can only accommodate two class years at a time. We don't have enough single rooms to accommodate everybody, but there will be shared bathrooms and that's gonna be another issue when people use shared bathrooms in school as well as outside of school, you need to clean those bathrooms down. And as individual teachers and um, in, in children in K through eight, we need to make sure when children are using the bathroom that that bathroom is cleaned in between uses. So we, in summary, the findings here are driven largely by the RT rather than the scenario. So screening will play a big role. Tracking rates will help us understand that. Um, and we will be learning as we go along. Um, I wanted to just provide with you, I won't go through them now. There are a number of different resources from the AAP uh, and the CDC and the NIH. And I wanted to stop there and thank you for your attention. Wow, Bonnie, that was great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, lots of attendees uh, on this talk and uh, at this point, 25 questions for you. Um, so I, I hope, um, are you okay going a little bit over? Uh, uh, let me see, I think, yes, I think I'm, yes, I'm fine. Okay, so I, I'm um, obviously not gonna be able to get to, to every question and I'm, I'm trying to consolidate them. Um, I think probably the most recurring theme uh, that I know you have a lot of expertise in is this question of how to test kids. Um, uh, for those of us that have had the NP swab and felt like it's a brain biopsy, um, trying to do that routinely on uh, young children is a challenge. So, so the question is, um, which tests are best for younger kids? And is, it, is there a possibility that we might see some of these tests uh, at schools? Yeah, so the same tests that we use for adults will be the mm -hmm. same tests that we would use for um, adults used for children. So unfortunately, the nasopharyngeal swab is still the gold standard. Uh, the nasal swab, which is the anterior nares, so that there's a simple video that we have where you can actually uh, swab the just the tip of the cute tip in the front of the nostril four times on each side. Um, actually works quite well, and we have a paper coming out finally uh, next week uh, around this area. We demonstrated high concordance. That is, 29 of 30 people who did that, adults, had concordant results with oropharyngeal swabs and other studies have now shown that NP and nasal swabs are, are uh, comparable in symptomatic patients. Now the problem is most of our people will not be symptomatic and so we're currently uh, validating the asymptomatic concordance with nasal swabs and nasopharyngeal and if we can get that done hopefully before the end of the summer our hope is that we could actually just use a the nasal swab approach. And we've actually used it in my studies uh, in young babies, a, an eight month old baby who didn't even wake up when we did that. So if we could get that asymptomatic child uh, doing the nasal swab, um, that might be an easy way to get that done. Um, sorry, my cat is here. Um, 
and uh, we could probably uh, think about ways uh, to do that um, uh, in a much easier way. Now, remember the cost of the test is an issue as well. They run well over $100 a test, so you can't do that in every school setting every day, obviously. Um, and you, it may get to the point where you're going to have to test people only when they're, um, you know, if it's critical for them to come back to school. Well, we're all rooting for you to get the less invasive one out there. Uh, so, they, oh, the, saliva testing doesn't work that well. Okay. Um, and so we're not as hopeful, but we would like to see if that works out. The other thing is we're working, looking to, to try to do pool testing. So that is taking a swab and putting all the swabs into one big te uh, PCR test um, and seeing if that's helpful. The problem with that is if you do too many or if somebody has a low viral load, you might miss them because you're diluting out that viral load with other, um, with, with all of the other pools. So that may also be available in the coming, um, in the coming months. You touched, you touched on this a little bit when you talked about some of the AAP guidance, but um, a couple questions about kids who have uh, chronic illnesses uh, like cystic fibrosis or maybe seasonal allergies and asthma that, that may have symptoms that, that would trigger concern at the school level. Uh, how, how do we approach those children? Well, I think, you know, that needs to be dealt with from the provider standpoint. Um, I do think that um, it depends on how sick the child might be. For example, I know Carlos Mila and others have been thinking about this. And the question is, if the child is a reasonably stable, um, you know, any respiratory infection will affect those kids, right? Lung transplant patients, you don't want any viral infections in children with lung transplants because of the risk of bronchiolitis obliterans. So, there will be some children where that may be an issue. We do know that asthma may be um, a risk factor. It's not clear in every study. In some studies it is, in others it's not. We don't really know in children, but I think well-controlled asthma might be okay. If a child does not have well-controlled asthma, that may be a concern in some situations. And then the question is, uh, can your school handle uh, dealing with children like that. So there, that needs to be a conversation with the primary provider, the specialist, if there is one, and then what the capacity of the school might be. Thank you. Um, a, a couple questions about force of transmission, uh, whether it's a screaming baby in clinic um, or a, a choir at school. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how that translates to transmission? Right, so force of infection is basically a dispersion, um, as a dispersion um, equation. Um, and what we generally know, we know from tuberculosis, and we know that young children are really not able to generate uh, sufficient uh, positive pressure to generate true aerosols. Um, so the question is, uh, but that's from tuberculosis, and what we don't understand is, could a young baby really cry hard enough to disperse uh, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 into the environment such that they would infect others. Now, I would argue that if, uh, if a provider is wearing a face mask and a shield, or at least a face mask, um, would that be enough? And, and, and the guidelines are changing here and there. You know, the CDC just recommended face, eye, eye protection as well, but that could be, you know, goggles as well. Uh, I, I don't think that young children are going to be able to do that. Now, we all know about the study, the, the situation in Seattle where there was a choir that did get infected. Quite a number of people were infected. Two people died. But those people were sitting, that is where force of infection comes into play, such as household transmission as well. They were together for many hours, singing together, eating together. I think that's a very different scenario than, say, uh, coming into a room and examining a well baby who might be crying uh, as they normally do in their bassinet. So I, I think those are two different scenarios. Um, and I, 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 my sense is that that wouldn't be as a, a problem. Okay. Um, the, there's a, a whole bunch of questions um, uh, about infection control within schools. Uh, and I'm going to try to um, sort of consolidate all those questions for you and, and you can pick and choose what you want to talk about. But the the, uh, someone asked about uh, air circulation and, and the extent to which circulating air uh, may either mitigate or perhaps um, 
uh, increased risk of transmission. Someone else asked, why are we focusing on deep cleaning if we think that um, you know, surface uh, contamination may be less of an issue after all? Someone else asked about uh, why aren't we doing some, some classes outdoors? Uh, and then, and then uh, another person just asked about whether UV light might have a role within the, the classroom. Yeah, so that's, those are all great points. I do think that uh, some of the schools are going to outdoor classes. I think dispersion is important. So yes, having, if you can and the weather's good, you could have some of your classes outdoors. In fact, I looked around campus the other day when I was walking over to a meeting and I thought, you know, there's plenty of places around here where we could have outdoor classes. Um, I do think that it keeps people spaced apart. You can still hear, and the virus uh, is less likely to, you know, to be enclosed in a room. Um, UV light um, is being used to, to um, sterilize face masks. Practically speaking, I'm not sure how you would implement that in a classroom setting. We have a giant robot, as you know, at the hospital, and that thing is pretty scary looking to children. I'm not sure that I would, and not only that, it's pretty expensive. Um, if you could do UV light in a room, I suppose that might be helpful, but I would say we need more testing to see how much UV light and how often you need to do it. Um, if, you know, for example, in my laboratory, I have, a, I have a hood where I use my viruses and at night we wipe it down, we turn on the UV light, it's on all night and the next morning everything's okay, but that's with a very known quantity of virus. Um, I do think that fomites could be an issue, especially in heavily traveled areas that are not cleaned. So it's only a problem if you don't clean it. So I would say I would continue to insist on cleaning. All of us who have children or have been around them, and that's all of us because we're pediatricians, know that we, they cannot control their secretions. So, um, you know, large globs of stuff all over the place, even if it's not going to be normally a problem in a 25 year old, in a two year old or three year old, there may just be more virus sitting on a, sitting on a surface. So it isn't a major source, but it could be one additional source in young children in particular. I'm gonna uh, make this the last question just for the sake of time. Um, uh, we, we've spent a lot of the hour talking about school, which is in August, but um, for many of us, uh, summer started, for my kids it started today. Uh, and um, uh, we are all wondering uh, what that means for camps um, and whether there's a question about overnight camps, but even day camps. Uh, any thoughts or recommendations about um, what our kids should do this summer? Yeah, well, actually, there are a number of camps that are opening. I've been looking. There is a guidance that we're putting together for the American Academy of Pediatrics also that should, hopefully should be coming out soon. But there is guidance around camps. It's going to be very similar. Um, I think, you know, you're going to have to limit the number of kids. The high-risk kids need to be careful. It's going to be a hybrid of, uh, of regular school and bringing uh, university students to a dorm. So making sure that there are single areas for children to sleep, that the bathrooms are going to be controlled. And I bring up the bathrooms, not because I think fecal transmission is going to be a huge issue, but because that's an opportunity for people to leave a lot of fomite uh, trans, uh, fomites in place. So I think making sure that there are staff to care for the kids that way. So uh, I think for some of you, you should be heartened. There are plans to open up some camps this summer. They're going to be limited. Obviously, people are going to have to bring their own equipment. The games are ha going to have to be very different. Uh, you know, no more, uh, you know, not a lot of hugging and touching, but there are a lot of activities kids can do that don't require touching or even being close together. So there will be camps out there this summer um, and um, uh, the guidelines should be coming out soon. Great, well, uh, thank you again, very informative. Um, and uh, again, I uh, wanna acknowledge all of the tireless work you're doing on this. So we very much appreciate it. This will be recorded uh, and um, look forward to seeing folks next week uh, for uh, another helpful grand rounds. Thanks, Dr. Mabamoto. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a safe and happy weekend. Take care. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.